Hi everyone, welcome back to Life Literature. Today I am going to handle another short story in our syllabus that is Lumber Room by Saki. I suppose that you have read this piece of short story several times and you are quite thorough with it and of course through a video it is impossible to handle or it is impossible to read the entire story. So my aim is to handle the summary of it and to discuss devices and then to proceed with the themes. Okay, let's get started. So Lumber Room by Saki uh, is a short story written by an outstanding British novelist and a short story writer called Hector Hugh Monroe. So he is better known by the pen name Saki. His pseudonym is Saki. So he is a writer who is very famous for writing witty and macabre stories. He had produced his works during the time of Edwardian society or he belonged to the Edwardian era. Edwardian era means the time of King Edward. King Edward had been the son of the very famous queen, Queen Victoria. So he was actually criticizing the conventions and the traditions of the Edwardian era in many of his works. The reason for this had been he had uh, grown under his grandmother and two of his aunts because his mother had passed away when he was very young and his uh, father had been abroad. So he was uh, taken care of by his grandmother and two of his aunts. Out of these two aunts, one aunt had been quite a rude one. So maybe because of his uh, experiences with this aunt during his childhood, he was against strict discipline uh, over children. So in, in this artistic work also in, of Saki, we see how he goes against conventions and how he subtly criticizes uh, these uh, rough methods of uh, raising children. We see such things in this piece of work also. Let's see how he satirizes the things that he hated as a child of the Edwardian society and culture. And also he, with this work he penetrates into the subtlest desires of a child's heart. That's why it becomes so very interesting. Okay, now we'll uh, try to move on to uh, the gist of the story first, the summary of the story first. So here, as the protagonist, we have a small child called Nicholas. So this Nicholas is a little orphan. That's how we come across this character in the short story. And this Nicholas, the orphan Nicholas, is trusted to his tyrannical aunt. Tyrannical means a person who uses power over others in a very cruel way. So we can call this aunt as a tyrannical aunt. So he was taken care of by a tyrannical aunt. This aunt is not only tyrannical, she is dull-witted also. That means uh, her sense of intelligence and her sense of amusement is very dull. She is not uh, much of a happy-go-lucky person. So he is taken care of such a person as the aunt. And at the beginning of the short story, we meet him uh, as a child who is put in disgrace. What do you mean by this? He is in disgrace. He is in disgrace means he is under punishment. He is under punishment uh, because he had done a very mischievous thing. I know you are quite aware of this mischievous act of Nicholas. He had 
put a frog he had brought a frog from the garden and he had put it into his breakfast plate and complained of a frog in his breakfast plate and refused to uh, have that wholesome bread and milk as the writer says right so that was the mischief that he had done and he was under punishment for that so the writer used the word he is in disgrace because of that and also he had uh, made his aunt believe that he was ready to go into the gooseberry garden because the aunt believed the gooseberry garden is the paradise for the little boy why does the aunt call it as a paradise because aunt believes that all sorts of entertainment all sorts of happiness is there for this child inside the gooseberry garden so she was quite sure that he would get into this gooseberry garden in the absence of the other children at home what happened to the other children at home who are actually the other children at home they are the cousins of nicholas the unimportant younger brother of nicholas as well two cousins girl cousin and boy cousin there had been another brother of him also in this home front so all of them were planned to they were sent to the jagabo beach as a punishment for nicholas and nicholas was excluded from this tour okay so that had been the punishment the aunt had thought for nicholas after the group of children had gone to the jagabo beach nicholas had other plans it was not the plan that aunt had thought that he would activate he had let aunt to believe in that he was ready to go into the gooseberry garden but instead he sneaked into the lumber room and they are inside the lumber room he comes across a tremendous picture of a hunter and a stag it was there inside the lumber room open to him just in front of his eyes and he was actually having a very good time a fantastic time inside the lumber room looking at everything looking at all the things that was there so many interesting things were there inside i'm going to ask from you what they had been later and he was enjoying himself in his own kind of way when he heard the sound of aunt as she had fallen into the uh, rain water tank inside the gooseberry garden in her desperate search for nicholas and then he goes out as he was observing the fascinating bird book he heard the sound of the aunt calling for aid and because of that he had to go out of the lumber room and he never gives he never gave his aunt a helping hand making all the others and making himself even believe that the one who was inside the rain water tank is the evil one and even he proves it uh, to the audience as well through the argument of the number of strawberry jams hidden inside the cupboard i hope you can remember these things very well so that part of the story that means the reading part of the story must be done by you it's very difficult to cope up uh, within a single video if we start reading this also so you have to make yourself thorough yourself thorough with these things that means the reading part of it and understanding part of it and after that you'll have to join in with this discussion okay so this uh, writing this piece of writing is done in the third person uh, narration and the charm of this piece of uh, work is it lies on the interesting plot and the exciting situation that saki is creating for us okay now let's see uh, how we are going to talk about the uh, situation the plot saki is handling in a deeper context we are going to dig into the short story now with that summary in our mind 
So when we take the entire short story, we can divide it into we can divide it into two basic parts. Here the uh, short story writer introduces the reader two types of worlds. The world of the child and the world of the adult. The child's world is represented by Nicholas and the adult's world is represented by the aunt, by the tyrannical, dull-witted aunt. So Nicholas here is presented as a very imaginative, very creative and also a very brainy child and not only that, he is quite mischievous as well. So, out of his mischievousness and out of his curiosity, he had uh, sneaked into the lumber room which had been closed. It had been a closed apartment, a closed room inside this massive house. And uh, this uh, secret the, the secrecy that was there within this room had made him curious to explore it. So in exploring, while exploring this lumber room, he was able to create such a fascinating story out of the tapestry picture. And he was able to finalize it. So there had been so many problems for him while he was observing the tapestry picture and he had been able to finalize it. He had been able to conclude it in a very interesting manner after coming, even after coming out of the lumber room in a very dull and gloomy, gloomy situation in complete silence while they were having their afternoon tea after everything had occurred during that day. It had been a great day for him and a hectic day for the aunt. So this imagine, imagination and creativity of Nicholas contrasts with the aunt's dullness and aunt's um, stupidity as well. Aunt had been a stupid woman as we come across her through the short story. Uh, so they are the lumber room. The lumber room is uh, presented as a symbol, symbol of fun and imagination and which is lacking in the adult world. The so many things inside the lumber room had been dull things for the aunt and the adults of the house. That's why they have kept it aside into a single room and locked it up. Maybe they were trying to preserve it isn't that so? Maybe they were trying to preserve those things, those beautiful things. I think they are the beauteous things which you need to decorate a house to make, make a house beautiful. But anyway, the aunt had put everything away inside one room, maybe to preserve, maybe without understanding the beauty, whatever it is. So the purpose is lacking here. The purpose of all these ornaments, all these things were lacking. The purpose was lost. The house is not made beauteous out of them. The house is made dull and colorless because all these beautiful things were locked inside the lumber room. So Nicholas explores all these things and enjoys all these things in his own kind of way. When, when you consider the adult, the writer seems to suggest that the adulthood causes one to lose all sense of fun. Aunt has lost her all sense of senses of fun. The aunt is not uh, enjoying life. The aunt is not happy. Aunt is always planning and preparing to control others, to empower others in a very cruel way. He, she wants to control these little children. They are very young children, but she is always trying to control them. And she is taking all the decisions for them. And also at the same time, she is deciding what is fun for them as well. She is the one who decides how the children gets fun. She thinks children gets fun only, only through circuses, only through uh, visits to beaches, so such such things which are very traditional, 
which are very common place those are the common place fun that children get very often everybody plans such things for children their imagination their creativity they are not catered to by the adults so that sort of an adult we find in the character of the aunt they are obsessed with insignificant things they are so filled with unimportant things what are these unimportant things punishing children nitpicking on children that means always trying to nag children so they are always uh, in such things they are full of um, insignificant priorities their priorities are controlling withholding and refusing those are their priorities most of the adults most of the time say no to everything okay now let's try to uh, dig more deeper by looking at the plot development of the story i suppose that you know what plot of a story is plot is the uh plot is the chain of incidents that happens within the story so we are going to see how this plot is developed so i suppose that you know the different stages of plot development such as the exposition the complication the climax and the denouncement so this is how the plot is developed uh, under these four stages so we'll see how the exposition is done exposition means something like setting the scene so whenever the writers start writing a story they introduce things to us about the characters about the place about the era they are referring to such things are exposed to the reader through the expository part of the story so in this expository part of the story we come across we meet the mischievous child nicholas and we meet the other people inside the house that means the important characters that we need for the short story mainly the aunt and then the other children who were there with him so these things were this information is given to us by that and also uh we uh, we are exposed to the mischief of nicholas also what he had done and we are exposed to the type of character of aunt he uh, she seems to be a strict disciplinarian and she seems to be uh, firmly believing in her religion and she considers every mischievous act of a child as a disgrace as a sin so she is strictly a religious lady right so that uh exposition is given to us to the expository part of the uh plot and then we come to the climax it slowly climbs up uh sorry not the climax the complication before we come to the climax the complication should appear and even before that we are revealed of the uh problem here so always there should be a conflict to develop a uh, story so the conflict here is nicholas being quite mischievous to put a frog into his breakfast please and he had refused his wholesome meal so this is the conflict there should be a punishment for nicholas so this is the conflict forwarded to us so after the conflict is forwarded you have to uh, uh, cope up with the complication with the story the complication happens as the other children were sent to the jagabo beach and nicholas was there inside the house all alone uh, and aunt was quite happy for being able to make him sad for being able to make him angry for being able to make him suffer but anyway aunt had doubts whether he would try to enjoy himself all, all alone by Uh, going into the gooseberry garden and that also aunt stopped by saying you are not to go into the gooseberry garden but anyway nicholas showed aunt tricked aunt by several attempts by showing some several attempts to sneak into the gooseberry garden and in his mind he had some other plans he was all set to explore the lumber room by 
all by himself. He is trying to get the fun all by himself. So always forbidden fruit is sweet, isn't that so? That's what Nicholas is going to do here. Because aunt has forbidden him any kind of enjoyment. So anyway, in the complication part, he had decided all these things. He had pretended uh, to be going into the gooseberry garden and he sneaks into the lumber room and enjoys himself. Can you remember, do you remember how he enjoyed himself inside the lumber room? Can you quickly list down, down the things that he had set his eyes on inside the lumber room? Yes, how many things were there inside the lumber room? Can you remember? Yes, you are quite right. There had been seven very fascinating things inside the lumber room. Shall I list them out? They are the frame tapestry in which there had been a very interesting story. So the writer says, for him, it had been a living, breathing story for him. Right, and secondly, there had been a roll of Indian hangings. It was full of dust, covered with dust, and it was on it that he was seated while observing the tapestry picture. And thirdly, there had been some twisted candlesticks in the shape of snakes. So these twisted ca candlesticks uh, for Nicholas's imaginative eyes look like snakes. Very interesting. No? And the fourth one, the fourth thing that there had been was a teapot, a very interesting teapot fashioned like a china duck. So it was in the shape of a duck. And Nicholas imagined how tea would come, how tea would flow out of the open beak of the duck. Quite interesting. And while observing that, he remembered the nursery teapot also, which was quite uninteresting in the uh, specific model of a teapot. So he, it, he felt it was quite uninteresting. So did you see, do you see how the adult looks at, at things. The adult had uh, put the commonplace, very ordinary type of teapot into the nursery and this fascinating piece of teapot was put inside the lumber room and it was under lock and key. How the adults look at things, the difference and how a brainy little imaginative child looks at things, the difference is there. So then we come across a carved sandalwood box so this carved sandalwood box was full of so many brass figures, little brass figures. There had been some aromatic cotton wool also, can you remember? And packed within this aromatic cotton wool, there had been little brass figures of hump-necked bulls, uh, peacocks and goblins. So Nicholas loved to touch and handle these things and to... Um, uh, kick his imagination, give a kick to his imagination. And finally, he came across a large square book with the black cover. At first, it looked as quite uninteresting because there had been only a plain black cover. But once he opened the book, uh, can you remember what he said, what the writer said? Behold, the word used by the writer was behold. So it had been so fascinating for Nicholas. There had been a gala of beautiful colored pictures of birds which he had never seen in his life. So those were the things found inside the lumber room. So he was quite, uh, quite drowned in this beauty and beauteous and imaginative world while he, when he heard the shrieking sound of aunt. So up to that was the complication. So that's how the complication had slowly and gradually developed. And then we come to the climax of the plot. The climax opens with that shriek and then Nicholas had to close the book, reluctantly of course, and to come out of the 
uh, lumber room so they are also we find how intelligent and tactful Nicholas had been because he had been very careful enough to come slowly out of the lumber room and also he kept the kept everything at their proper places he closed the book and even he was extremely careful to put some dust from a, a nearby pile of newspaper on it just to uh, just to show that there had not been any intrusion into, into the lumber room and he slowly came out locked the uh, door and kept the key at the proper place can you remember the proper place of the key where he found the key on the top of the shelf in the inside the library one of the shelves inside the library so he kept it at the proper place and came out of the lumber room just to find no he did not find just to heard the shrieking sound of the aunt coming from the rainwater tank as she had very unfortunately slipped inside the rainwater tank while searching for Nicholas inside the gooseberry garden assuming that he had surely uh, gone into the gooseberry garden violating her orders she must be thinking to punish him for a second time or so for violating his orders but unfortunately he she was there inside the rainwater tank and then follows the argument between the aunt and the nephew the argument was so interesting because the nephew Nicholas uh, does not attempt to go inside the gooseberry garden even though aunt pleads with him the aunt wanted him to come inside the gooseberry garden and to give him give her the little ladder from under the cherry tree but Nicholas refuses why on the basis of being quite obedient to the aunt's orders so he refuses it and then he raises a question just to check whether it was really the aunt inside the rainwater tank can you remember that question he asked from the prisoner inside the tank here the writer is quite witty to use that phrase the prisoner in the tank without specifically mentioning who was there really inside the rainwater tank he uses the phrase prisoner inside the tank so he wanted to check whether the prince uh, the prisoner inside the tank is really the aunt he knows that it was really the aunt but he pretends because he's really a mischievous little boy so he gives a question he raises a question what is the question he asks can you remember yes will there will there be strawberry jam for tea so that's what he asked he wanted to check so what was the answer of the aunt yes of course and then Nicholas puts forward his argument. I know that there are four bottles of strawberry jams inside the cupboard. And of course, the evil one knows. Why? The evil spirits are everywhere. They know everything. So the evil one also knows. But the poor aunt doesn't know about it. Why? Because the previous day, the aunt had told him, they have run out of strawberry jam they had uh, no more strawberry jam inside the house when they were asking for it so the poor aunt was unaware of the four bottles of strawberry jam inside the cupboard so Nicholas of course no because he had peeped in and the evil spirits all know it so how do you know if you are the aunt inside the strawberry sorry if you are the aunt inside the uh, rainwater tank such a beautiful argument such a tactful argument and also such a brainy argument there he proves the person the prisoner inside the tank cannot at all be the aunt surely the one who's inside the rainwater tank is the evil one not the aunt so proving that our argument he leaves the place letting the poor aunt to stay there inside the rainwater tank exactly as the writer mentions for 30 uh, undignified minutes 
So the proud, arrogant aunt was put a prisoner inside the rainwater tank, inside the gooseberry garden, in a very destitute manner. So that is the climax. When he goes away from that place, the climax ends. The climax star starts with the shriek of the aunt and the climax ends at the place where Nicholas goes back inside the house. So then comes as the final stage of the plot development comes the denouncement. So at the denouncement stage, we see the entire family, we can call it a family, isn't it? So, so entire family uh, was seated at the afternoon tea table and it had been a very dull moment because aunt was so silent out of her hurt pride and uh, because all her plans had gone uh, in vain and he, she was suffering her dignity, her dignity was hurt so she was silent. And what about the other children? They had not enjoyed the Jacobo beach. Why? Because there had been a very high tide that day and they could not play uh, on the beach. And also Bobby's shoes had been too tight. He could not run as well. So they had not enjoyed. But what about the silence of Nicholas? He was so absorbed in the story of the tapestry picture. He was thinking, he was thinking of a conclusion, a beautiful and a tricky conclusion for the hunter and the hound to escape the approaching four wolves. How would they escape? Yes, he had got the idea. They would surely escape once the four wolves would feed on the stricken stag. So that becomes the denouncement. So at the denouncement stage, we see how all the others were suffering who were meant to be happy and enjoying uh, that afternoon. And instead, Nicholas was quite enjoying the afternoon who was meant to suffer. So everything had turned the other way, other way round. Okay, so that was the denouncement. So that was the plot development with the four stages, exposition, complication, climax and the denouncement. So that is the plot development. Now we'll start to find out the devices we find here in the short story. One of the major devices I have come across in this short story is the use of epithets. What are epithets, children? Epithets are adjectives or adjectival phrases used to describe a character or a quality. So there are so many epithets inside the short story. And these epithets also can be divided into two categories. Epithets that belong to the child's world and the epithets that belong to the adult's world. First, we'll tackle the epithets that belong to the child's world such as grim chuckle. Can you remember that place? Alleged frog, unknown land, stale delight, mere material pleasure, bare and cheerless, thickly growing vegetation. So they are the epithets, adjectival phrases, which we find there are so many more. I have just mentioned a few here. And belonging to the adults world, frivolous ground, various nonsense, considerable obstinacy, trivial gardening operation, unauthorized intrusion. So these are the epithets that we find here in the short story. Secondly, I have selected for you another device, metaphors. There are some, especially some sustained metaphors. Sustained means you don't see them clearly here. They are kind of hidden inside the, some of them are kind of hidden inside the short story. Some sustained metaphors are there. For example, if you take uh, this uh, phrase, Circles of unrivaled merit and uncounted elephants. So this phrase shows the aunt's narrow-mindedness. 
So the aunt's narrow-mindedness is quite equal to this phrase because aunt thinks that children enjoy these things to the brim. All, so this is a very commonplace way of, yes, they enjoy, that's true, when it is so rare for you. But anyway, these are the common enjoyments of children, common entertainment of children. So this phrase shows an aunt is narrow-minded. So that is a metaphor for aunt. And also the aunt, the writer says at one place, self-imposed center duty connected to aunt. Can you remember? So this self-imposed center duty connected to the aunt shows that aunt is a very strict person. So that is a metaphor, another metaphor for aunt. And there's another very direct metaphor for aunt also, evil one. Evil one is equal to aunt. It was proven by Nicholas very beautifully. And then a region so carefully sealed from youthful eyes. What is this region? This region is the lumber room, another metaphor. And there's, I forgot to tell you, another metaphor for aunt that is the prisoner in the tank. Another metaphor for art. So there are metaphors like that. Third device, rhetorical question. You know what rhetorical questions are? Questions asked without expecting a proper answer just uh, for the purpose of highlighting, enhancing. So the there's one very beautiful rhetorical question here in the short story like this. But did the huntsman see what Nicholas saw? That four galloping wolves were coming in his direction through the wood. So that is the question the writer was asking or actually Nicholas was thinking while observing carefully, actually studying very carefully that tapestry picture inside the lumber room. So this stresses Nicholas's power of imagination. This question stresses Nicholas's intelligence, his wit, his brains. And fourthly, the device hyperbole is also found. I'll give you one example. You yourself should search for more. Example, how did she howl? Can you remember when Nicholas was referring to the girl cousin as she was uh, starting his journey to Jagabo Beach after climbing inside the carriage and scraping her knees and he, she was crying loud, aloud. So here Nicholas is even exaggerating a little bit while complaining it to the aunt how did she howl, right? So that is the fourth device that I have found for you. The next device, one of the most important devices we find here and which is seen everywhere throughout the short story, irony. Irony fills the short story because here Nicholas looks at the world of adults in a very ironical uh, eye in a very sarcastic point of view, in a very cynical point of view. So irony is abundant inside the short story. I will show you some of the situations where irony lies inside the short story. Number one irony is the prank Nicholas played on, uh, played at the breakfast table is considered by the aunt as a disgrace. What is a prank? Prank is a, a trick performed as a joke. A trick performed as a joke. So this trick which was done as a joke was considered by the aunt as a disgrace, as a sin. And she calls it as falling from grace. So such serious ideas about a simple joke. That is how the adults look at the little mischiefs of little ones. So that is ironical. And also the second place where you, another place you find irony, the trip to the Jagabo beach. It was meant to spite 
Nicholas. Meant to make Nicholas angry. But what happened? Instead, it becomes a punishment for the entire other lot of children. They had not enjoyed, they have suffered the entire afternoon. And uh, in addition, it had become a torture to those who went. While Nicholas enjoyed his punishment over his exploration of the lumber room. So that is also quite ironical. And thirdly, the aunt's idea of a paradise. The aunt calls the gooseberry garden as a paradise. Aunt believes it is the paradise for Nicholas. She firmly believes that because what do you find inside a gooseberry garden? Of course, the gooseberries are there, the trees are there, uh, maybe other kinds of fruits are also there, maybe it, is, uh, it had been an orchard. So what can, you, what can children do inside a gooseberry garden? Yes, of course, pick and taste the fruits and to hide, to climb trees, to uh, sneak inside, creep inside. So those activities children can do. Maybe there are birds and butterflies and uh, beautiful creatures like uh, such creatures may be there. So children can enjoy. But anyway, it is a commonplace enjoyment for children. Nothing to kindle your imagination. Everything is physical. Nothing is spiritual. Can you remember Nicholas called it? It is a mere material pleasure. Can you remember? Nicholas called the gooseberry garden as a mere material pleasure. Why? Because it provided him only the physical happinesses only. Physical pleasures only. Whereas the lumber room kindled his imagination, kindled his creativity. So it gave him some kind of a spiritual pleasure as well. But the aunt believed physical pleasure is everything, is the only thing needed for children. So that is quite ironical. The aunt is unable to understand the pleasures, how children enjoy themselves. They need not only the physical pleasures, they need these mental pleasures, the mental exercises as well. So about that, aunt was quite unaware. So that is quite ironical. And also, the ideal world for an adult is we see it we see it is quite dull for a child what is the ideal world for an adult according to the aunt shown here strict full of religious values full of conventions full of traditions full of discipline so this is what the adults world means when you see it through the eyes of the aunt so this type of world is quite boring for children so that type of adult world also provides the irony here because there are so many adults in our society, not only in the Edwardian era of England, even here, even at this moment, even at the modern times, we find such adults among us. So here the writer is laughing at such adults. And also... Uh, the story represents Nicholas's story. Why do I say so? Because as the hunter and the hounds escape the approaching wolves in the in that tapestry story, here Nicholas also escaped from the tyranny of the aunt in a very trickish manner. How did the hunter and the hounds escape the wolves? In a, in a trickish manner. No? How? Because the wolves feasted on the stricken stag and while the hunter and the hounds escaped the wolves. It was a kind of a trick that was being played on the wolves. In the same manner, just like the hunter and the hounds, Nicholas also escaped the tyranny of the aunt by playing quite a nasty trick on her. So her idea of punishment, Nicholas had turned it out to be, a, be an entertainment.
So this actually is the story of Nicholas, not of the story of Aunt, even though Aunt planned everything. So with that, we end the devices, the discussion on the devices. And now we are approaching to the final part of our discussion on Lumber Room, that is the themes. I think the themes I have already discussed with you, even though I have not specifically mentioned them to you. The first theme, the first most important theme is the generation gap. What is this generation gap? The adult world and the children's world. How the adults think of children and how children think of adults. So this generation gap, it is being expressed here within the story as a clash, as a conflict, as a very big difference because here we get a very strict and rude and tyrannical adult who does not understand the wishes and the desires of children at all. So because of that, this clash is there between the aunt and Nicholas. So here, uh, through Nicholas, we find what children actually expect. What do children actually expect? How would they like to spend their lives? They like, they are in constant search for freedom. They like freedom. They go in search for freedom, just as Nicholas had done. And also, they have a very uh, high power of imagination and a high power of creativity. And we should give them opportunities to heighten, to develop that imagination and creativity. They enjoy doing that. And also, they get satisfied through very trivial things. Trivial things mean simple things. They don't need much to be contented. You need not to take them to big circuses. You need not take them to these beaches, faraway beaches and all, they can be satisfied even by the simplest things. Maybe through a beautiful, colorful book of birds. Maybe through a picture of a story. Maybe through just a little brass structure. Children can be satisfied. So we need to understand that reality. And also, they have their innate curiosity. They are born with this curiosity. You need to give them chances to satisfy their curiosity, fulfill their curiosity in a good manner. So it was all done. The whole story had occurred because of Nicholas's curiosity. Maybe that little mischief that he had performed at the breakfast table by putting a frog into his breakfast plate maybe it had also been a been the first part of his plan of his master plan no? so this is an entire master plan of Nicholas the first stage of his master plan had been putting the frog into the plate of breakfast why because he wanted to explore the lumber room because it was always locked and hidden away from the children so he wanted to see what was inside that. So this is this master plan actually activated through the curiosity of this little child. By the way, how old do you think is Nicholas? There were several clues for us inside the short story. There had been a mentioning about a nursery. There had been a mentioning about the schoolroom door. No? So that means He's, he's, he's at school going age and he's in nursery. That means he's no more than five years old. Very little, a small fellow. Right, another, uh, another child's desire, love of nature. That's why he got the idea. He was so fascinated and he was so absorbed, absorbed in that uh, picture book of birds love of nature and also children are intelligent and tactful. Nicholas is the very picture of child intelligence and the master tactfulness of children. 
So that's the world that we see through children. What about the world that we see through the adults, especially the adults such as aunts? Now, don't you get that uh, get this idea that all adults are just like aunt? There are so many good adults who have a uh, proper and better understanding of children. This is only a one sector of adult world which is being represented by the aunt. So, what about such adults like aunts? Yes. They are, there are so many social vices in adulthood. Vices means bad things, corruptions, corrupted things are there in adult society. Such as uh, pretense, they pretend so much in the adult society, there is pretense. In other poetry also in our syllabus we have talked of pretense. Can you remember about um, Gabriel Okara's poem, Once Upon a Time, no, pretense, and even in Clown's Wife, pretense is discussed, adults pretend so much. So, pretense is there. And self-interest, they are so very enthusiastic, so very interested in themselves, not about others. Even though they understand children, they like to control children. Why? Because it is easier for them if they are controlled always so they think of their own uh, conveniences and also they uh, they are quite authoritative over others they try to empower others with their power sorry not empower others they try to uh, force their powers on others right so that authority is there with them always and also a very bad thing they do, even in our society I have seen this. They use religious concepts to instill fear in children, to uh, create a fear inside children. They use religious concepts like that. So the religious concepts are there for the betterment of any society, but the adults take one or two randomly and they try to create a fear inside the children's mind about religion, which is of course very bad because it creates a negative idea towards religion. Here the aunt uses the word sin, disgrace and things like that to uh, describe the little mischief of Nicholas. That is very bad. It harms the religion and also the hypocrisy of adults. Adults are quite hypocritic. Hypocritic means they are very shrewd, cunning. Can you see? Can you remember the strawberry jam incident? They are stingy also, isn't that so? Stingy also. So those things are there and also they are very snobbish. They are very much arrogant about themselves. They are very proud about themselves but they have nothing in them. Just like the aunt. So such things are discussed here about the adult world uh, through the short story. The second theme I would like to emphasize on is the moral degradation and hypocrisy of the adults. So I have already discussed it in the part of the adults word. So the moral degradation, so they don't have good values. Adults don't have good values, not all. You have to mind that a section of the adult society. They don't have good values and they are very hypocritic and the early examples I have discussed with you also applies here, apply here as well. So those are the two major basic themes we come across in the short story Lumber Room. I hope that you have got a good idea about Lumber Room through this video. And we'll be meeting with another video very soon. Till then, goodbye.